Good afternoon, folks. Uh, my name is Deepak, uh, and I'm here to talk about the future trends of monetization. So it'll be more broad, just giving you more of an overview of what are some of the different trends we see. Just a quick note about myself. I run product and engineering at Chartboost. You might ask, who is Chartboost? For those of you who don't know, we're the world's largest monetization platform for gaming audiences with our SDK and over 300,000 apps. We are basically in over 90% of the top grossing iOS and Android apps. So we see somewhere between 800 million to a billion unique devices each month, which allows us to collect a lot of data and you know, information about what are some of the categories of games that audience is like. You know, are you a casino player? Are you a trivia player? And we utilize that information to create rich targeting profiles that allow us to say, OK, if you're a casino player, let's show you more ads related to casino games. Right? So let's, uh, let's see what the, um, uh, what are we going to talk about today? So one, I want to give you a little bit more information about state of the industry, right? What's going on here? Um, are the number of DAUs increasing, decreasing, about stagnant? Which parts of the world are we seeing more growth in? Second, you know, ad formats are always evolving. So going beyond just the tra traditional static banner ad to rewarded video to playables, let's just kind of take a quick peek at what do we see as emerging ad formats. Third, you might ask, OK, this is interesting, but what's going on with the gaming user? right? What's happening with the audience? So we'll go into that, and we'll talk about brands and how they can kind of have a more of a increasing their spend into these mobile games. And fourth, we'll talk about how is the trend going towards platforms? How are we automating buying and selling of these ads? So before I jump into it, quick show of hands, how many of you work for a mobile gaming company? Okay. Few of you, how many of you are utilizing ads in some format, some way or shape to like monetize your properties? Okay, few. So this will be interesting. Okay, great. Um, so let's look at this. Um, so let's look at the overall industry, right? In the United States, there was a huge stage of growth where the number of mobile gamers was increasing between 2011 to 2016. But what we see now is that this is mostly peaked. Right? So according to a lot of data from eMarketer and NewZoo, what we see that while there will still be some user growth, it's largely plateaued out. So what this means to a lot of gaming publishers is that you know, you're not going to see that kind of huge growth that we were seeing in the past. And, you, and gaming publishers have to fight extra hard to figure out ways to monetize their audiences. So you might ask, OK, in the United States, it's kind of stagnant. But are there other areas of the world where we are seeing huge growth? And the answer is absolutely yes. So you look at markets in Asia, and specifically in China, what we see is that there is still a lot of tremendous growth happening year over year in China. There are more users coming online with their smartphones. They're buying more sophisticated smartphones. And they're playing a lot more games and spending a lot more money in them. Almost a quarter of the money in mobile gaming, so about the mobile gaming revenue is about $46 billion, estimated for 2017, of which roughly about 11.2 roughly about 25% is going to be happening in China. So this is a big market to watch out for mobile game publishers. And if you don't have a strategy yet for Chinese, game for Chinese audience monetization, you better start thinking of one right now. Right? So with that, uh, you might think, OK, we understand that the users in the US are stagnant. But what about the number of sessions? What about the time spent? So let's take a quick peek at that. So the good news is that mobile app usage continues to grow 11%. The bad news is that most of the time and the number of boot ups that are happening are all happening in messaging and social. Not very surprising. So you're either checking out your friends' news feeds, and when you're not doing that, you're spending time watching your favorite sports activity, or you're shopping, right? Which that means is that when people are spending a lot of time playing games, it started to slow down, right? Similarly, when you look at the number of the amount of time spent, the amount of time spent on your phone is increasing 70%. That's huge. But again, most of the time spent on your phone is going towards Facebook and you know, Instagram and going to uh, Snapchat, right? And again, shopping and sports, people are spending buying on Amazon. But the number of gaming, the time spent in games is decreasing at a slight pace of 4%, right? So again, it's not all that bad. A large majority of time is still spent on games. But again, mobile game publishers have to focus and work even harder to figure out how to increase eCPMs and to keep revenue growing strong. So what are some of the tactics that mobile game publishers, and I feel like even beyond mobile games, just 
mobile monetization, what do, you, what do they need to do to keep their audiences as well as their revenues growing? The number one thing, and we'll talk about, is ad formats. And what we see is that in the world of gaming, free-to-play continues to stay dominant. So it's not going anywhere. But what's more important is that users need to feel choice. They feel like they need to opt in. So what we see among ad formats is the mobile app rewarded spot continues to hold very strong. Why is that? Because most of the times it's a value exchange which is very explicit. I want to earn some currency. I'm going to go ahead and opt in to watch a video. And then I'm going to make, you know, the advertiser gets a chance to show an ad that leads to some conversion. It makes money for both, right? And what we see is that even though this spot was typically traditionally dominated by video, but what we see is the advent of not just video, but also rewarded playables, and then brand ads coming into play here. So let's see what, what this means. And again, the other things about click to play and skippable is all emphasizing choice. When you give the user a choice rather than doing an autoplay or non-skippable, that's irritating to them. The banner pop-up is irritating to them. So try to focus on ad formats that give the user's choice. You will actually find it's a win-win for the user, for the advertiser, and the publisher. And we have tons of data that is actually showing us that this is true. right? So. The other thing that we should keep in mind that is that the classic marketing funnel where you have exposure, some intent, some conversions is changing. And especially in the mobile gaming advertising world, for user acquisition, it's becoming even more and more sophisticated. So it's going beyond just the conversion or the install event. Performance advertising is now becoming a lot more about ROI and retention as well as purchases. How many people are making in-app purchases? How many people are coming back on day 7, day 14, day 30? So what does that mean? That it means that interactivity has a role to play, right? While most people have been passively watching video, playables or these interactive games give people a chance to participate and try out the game before they actually install it. So what does that mean? Let's dig in and see what that means. So the two big ad formats we continue to holds sway even in the short term. One is video, and the other one is interactive. With video, it's more of a passive experience. So we continue to see that 71% of players, according to this data from Unity, you know, over 70% of players prefer to watch a video ad and more of a rewarded location. So when it's an opt-in, which is the rewarded location, 54% of that prefer it. Right? Um, and so what we see is that when you're asking users to watch the video, they'll watch it, they'll learn a little bit more about the game, they're incentivized to then kind of you know, say, OK, there's strong interest. I actually like this game, or I like what genre or category they're showing. So I'm going to go ahead and go to the App Store. The, if, what's more important is that the install is not incentivized. Watching the ad is incentivized. But the actual conversion event is organic. or like it's, it's, You have to make a choice towards it. But what we see even more interesting is that in video, vertical is very much in, right? So here's the interesting data point. You might ask, why is vertical such a big thing? What we see even in our ad network is that close to 50% of the ad impressions we see are portrait in nature. That means most of the games, half the games are like vertical mode rather than the landscape mode. Yet most of the traditional videos that are built by gaming and non-gaming are in landscape mode, so the typical screen format. That doesn't render very well. It shows up at the top of the screen. It's a suboptimal experience. So what we are seeing is a big trend, and it was pioneered by Snapchat, saying the way you hold the phone is the way you should be watching videos. So what we see is that we are building a lot more vertical videos for these advertisers, and we are seeing somewhere between 10 to 20% conversions, better conversions than the traditional landscape format. So this is here to stay. And if you are thinking about user acquisition and you have a video ad unit, make sure it's, it's vertical and landscape in nature. Right? The other key trend we see is that in interactivity. And what we see here is that you know, when people have a chance to like play a game, try it out, see what this means, they tend to have a deeper kind of uh, engagement with the ad unit, and that leads to a better conversion, better quality retention, as, as well as some purchases lift. So we looked at this, and we've been, at Chartboost, we've been making playables for a few months now. We've launched over 100 of them, and we see a lot of success uh, across different co categories. So you see over here is more like a, a casino playable, like for slots, but even for match three or trivia or puzzle games, simulation games, we see that there is a much 
higher lift in terms of installs per 1,000 users, as well as increased CPM. A number of publishers initially expressed concern, hey, will this take away attention from my game? Right? Will, I be, will users continue to play the organic game? What we see is that they know, even when we've done a number of A-B tests, we see no discernible increase of retention or decrease in retention of the, of the publishing games. So what you see here is the experience right, where like, users can like, simulate what it means to play this game. They can interact with it, and then they decide if they want to install it or not. So we definitely see this trend continuing to hold sway. So now that we've talked about ad formats, right, um, we should also talk a little bit about the gaming audience. So we understand that when it's a gaming uh, user, they will tend to be having a stronger affinity for gaming ads. But what does this mean for like non-gaming ads? right? And the first thing before we go there is we should try to understand who is the typical gaming user. Right? What we find is that a lot of, when we talk to a lot of brand marketers and agencies, they'll say, oh yeah, we just think that the gaming, typical gaming person is this, this nerdy male, 70 to 24, who sits in a basement playing games. That's wrong. That's more, more uh, likelihood of like the console market. But when you look at the mobile gaming market, it's very much mainstream. So we did some surveys, and we, did a, we actually commissioned a study uh, to find out that what does the audience look like in the United States because of the huge amount of the reach that we have and the kind of users we see. What we saw was very interesting that the average age is actually between 35 to 44, right? And it actually skews more female than male. 62% of our audiences in the US playing games is female, and two thirds of them have one or more children in the household. So if you think about it from a brand perspective, they are more likely to have affinity towards be showing brand ads to these kind of gaming audiences, right? What this means is that the gamer is more likely to be female, 35. So think about young mom with kids. They are more as, just as likely to inter if they're playing Candy Crush or Bubble Witch on their phones, right? They're just as likely to interact with a movie trailer for an upcoming date night, or they're just as likely to interact with a McDonald's ad to figure out the next discount coupons. And I really feel that brands are really missing out on this opportunity to show up in front of mobile in-app audiences because they don't understand the nature of the gaming uh, 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 ecosystem. Right? So there's more education that's required here. But I definitely see a lot more advertising spend coming up through brand ads into mobile game publishers. So you might ask about economics. And again, what we see is that close to 2 thirds of these mobile gamers have more than $50,000 in annual income. That means they have discretionary income, right? So they tend to you know, buy in personal care, education, apparel, entertainment. I think you get the picture, right? It's a very broad set of categories in which they tend to spend in. They're mainstream, they have discretionary income, and they're buying across all these categories. So that's a little bit about the gaming audience. What this means in terms of gaming publishers is that we have to think beyond just games. It's really a combination of games and brands that leads to higher fill rates. And brands do pay much higher eCPMs. In the United States, we can see upwards of $20 CPMs for mobile video, which means it's a good game plan for publishers to say, let's have a combination of both games as well as brand ads that show up to my audience. Right? So now that we understand the diversity in demand, the next question you might ask is, OK, most of the ad networks and the SDKs we have plugged in have the ability to go reach out to gaming advertisers, gaming UA. How would they go and get access to brands? We kind of struggled at Chartboost with the same question. And where we came to realize is that the world of advertising has largely gone programmatic. Right? So it's all automated buying and selling uh, through demand side platforms, through ad exchanges. And this is where brands are spending their money. They want to spend money on different audiences, but through programmatic buying. And so we definitely see that trend. And so before we go there, brands want to reach your audience. You can see like movie trailers and Pizza Hut. But uh, kind of talking about how automation of buying and selling is happening, I want to take a few minutes just to describe how these platforms are evolving. And what we see is that traditionally, most of the game publishers have gone down this mediation route. What that means is they set up one SDK, or they might set up multiple ad network SDKs. And then looking at historical eCPMs, they'll say, oh, who's, you know, is Chartboost the highest? OK, it's $20 CPMs. Great, I'm going to put this in number one. Or it's Unity or Ad Colony. But it's all based on historical data. Whereas if you look at the programmatic world, it's all based on real-time bidding, which means when a user is in front of their phones, send this request into a real-time bidding infrastructure, basically a live auction, and let multiple demand-side platforms, ad networks compete 
to see who wants to bid on that ad request and let the highest winner win. Right? That's a more rational and a better economic marketplace. But for whatever reasons, gaming publishers have been largely remained with this mediation way. And we think that's going to change a lot more and evolve more into this kind of a format where the publisher, this is just an anecdotal example, doesn't have to be Angry Birds. But what we expect to see is that when users are playing games, that's the publisher, you know, we're going to have see more of this concept of what we call as a header bidding SDK, which in simple plain speak really means that rather than trying to rely on a pre-mediated set of waterfall rules, it opens it up to an auction. And in turn, it goes to an exchange. And then the exchange is basically sending that ad request concurrently to multiple ad networks and demand side platforms who will then determine in real time, typically less than 100 milliseconds, as to how much do they want to bid for that ad request. So if it's like a US iOS user, they're like, yeah, you know what? This is, person is on iOS 10, living in the Western United States. It's a high propensity to go and buy something, convert into some action. I'm willing to pay $20 CPMs for this user. So let the highest winner win. And what that means is real time bidding, high CPMs. The publisher wins with higher CPMs, better fill rates. The ad network wins because it's a rational marketplace, right, as opposed to a pre mediated one. And the user wins because they are seeing better targeted, better quality ads. Right? So we definitely see a strong trend. It's already happened in the desktop and mobile web world. We expect to see that in the mobile gaming world also in the next two to three years. And Chartboost, at Chartboost, we set up our own ad exchange the last few months. We've seen a lot of good participation rates from different DSPs. So we are seeing firsthand the power of programmatic buying and selling in the advertising world. Right? So just to then kind of recap, right? what are the kind of key takeaways from here? Uh, Players expect high quality ads. We see that in the rewarded locations. We see that with these interactive ads as playables. I also see a trend where beyond gaming, even non-gaming, so basically like brands like Coke or you know, Bud Light, I will start to create like fun interactive games that kind of very much mimic what we are seeing with Snapchat and other like Instagram. And so we see that trend happening with high quality interactive ads. Secondly, we see that we talked about how gaming sessions are getting saturated in the US. That means gaming publishers have to work harder to figure out smarter monetization strategies. They have to figure out better ways to do in-app purchases, as well as for ads. If you're doing a free-to-play, how do you make higher eCPMs? And playable ads is one answer. Video is another answer. Brands is a third answer, which is how do you get more brands to participate in your inventory in front of your users? Third, we see that. The market is going to get more and more rational. It's no more, no more going to be waterfall. We expect to see a lot more real-time bidding and auctions happening within the programmatic space around mobile game ads. And that's pretty much it. Uh, we still have about a minute. So if there are any questions, uh, happy to answer for, for you guys. Yes. Oh, can, excuse me. Can we get a mic to you? Because we, we can't hear it otherwise. So uh, there we go. Someone's coming around with one. Thank you. Playable ads that have nothing to do with the uh, actual core gameplay. So I think Game of War there's these playable ads that have actually nothing to do with what Game of War is about. What do you think about those ads? The question was, what do you think about playable ads that have nothing to do with the core gameplay? Right. <laughs> sure. <laughs> no, I, I get your question. And I would generally, I think the best practice we see is that when the gameplay of the playable is as close to the actual game, we see much higher. Uh, you know, install rates. Actually, even more interestingly, we see higher retention rates because those users will keep coming back to the game if it's more like a click switch and I don't know about that specific playable that you're mentioning about. But what we do see is good best practices that the closer your playable is to the actual gameplay, uh, it, it turns out to be better. What we've done is we've adopted where we have like creative producers who are very much like gaming enthusiasts, and they'll play the game for a day or two, understand the, the storyboard of the game, the actual game design, and they'll factor those key elements of the game into building that playable. And we've seen much better, you know, we have to put more time up front, but we see better success when we do what, what you're suggesting. Any other questions? Yeah, that's a great question. 
What we see, we actually used to have CPCV, and we still offer it today. What we see is most of the gaming advertisers index towards performance. They just say, I'll pay you on a cost per install basis, so we index to that. Majority of our spend comes from that CPI-based thing. On the exchange, it is CPM-based, so we let the DSP take the risk, but they in turn are converting it into either CPI or CPCV. In the future, what we are seeing is like a lot more brands are starting to participate. We see Target, we see Uber, we see other brands like Walmart participating. And we do expect that those guys will be just tend to be more CPM or CPCV with more focus on viewability. Like they want to make sure that there's viewability happening. 